thanks again for inviting me. It's a little humbling to uh, try to get to the science of this after watching this film um, and getting at the heart of it, which is really the most important part. Um, but what I'd like to do is take just a few minutes to talk a little bit about locked-in syndrome, give you some perspective on that condition. So first a little bit about uh, the condition that's known as locked-in syndrome. Uh, essentially what it involves is uh, a number of symptoms that are characterized by a person who's got preserved or intact awareness. Um, relatively intact cognitive or thinking skills um, and the ability to communicate. However, um, while being paralyzed and voiceless, so unable to communicate using voice. Um, there are five criteria that sort of define the syndrome technically, uh, and those are the ability to sustain eye opening um, and preserved vertical eye movement, and I'll talk a little about a little bit more about that in a moment because as you saw in the film Mr. Bobby had more than vertical eye movement um, but technically locked in syndrome includes the ability to have at least vertical eye movement. Um, preserved higher cortical functions in other words the the higher levels of the brain are intact persons able to think reason remember focus attention problem solve and so forth. Aphonia or severe hypophonia means inability or difficulty producing voice. Um, quadriplegia, quadriparesis, inability to move um, the muscles in the upper or lower extremities. Um, and the primary mode of communication for people who have locked in syndrome is this use of eye movements uh, and blinking. There are different types of locked-in syndrome, three kind of categories, broad categories. One is the classic locked-in syndrome, and in that condition, a person has total paralysis, can't speak, but is conscious, and has these vertical eye movements, but just vertical, up and down, not the ability to move the eyes horizontally. There's incomplete locked-in syndrome, in that case, the person may have limited voluntary movement um, in some muscle groups in addition to the eyes, and that's mostly facial muscles. Sometimes the ability to um, move the muscles of the cheek, sometimes the ability to move the mouth, um, and often the ability to move the eyes in more than a, a vertical orientation. And this is really where Mr. Bobby fit in. He had incomplete locked-in syndrome. Student Judy Mazursky wrote a book called Locked In, A Young Woman's Battle with Stroke. She was a college student when this happened, uh, 19 years old. At that point, this was in the year 2000, there were some more advanced communication systems, and I'll show you some of those in a few moments. Um, and she also wrote a book, was able to use computer-assisted communication for that. It's a rare condition, uh, represents less than 1% of all the strokes. Typical age of onset, not really a typical age, but anywhere between 17 and 52 years old, um, which is young compared to strokes in general, which tend to occur later in life, but not always. Um, survival rates are quite high. Um, if a person is going to pass away, it's typically very early on because of medical complications. If they survive those early complications, then after 10 years, there's an 85% survival rate. After 20 years, about 40%. Um, occasionally, it's transient. Um, so if it's an infectious or metabolic issue, sometimes it can be reversed and the person will experience the symptoms of being locked in for a period of time and then they will resolve. In most cases, unfortunately, motor recovery is limited. Um, most folks are able to breathe on their own and not have to be mechanically ventilated. Um, about a third will eventually be able to utter some speech, isolated words at least. So we'll talk a bit about rehabilitation. The early focus, as uh, I mentioned before, is on achieving medical stability, getting the person to the point where their pulmonary function is stable, they're able to breathe either on their own or through a mechanical ventilator, getting their blood pressure stable, um, getting them neurologically stable, establishing a mechanism for them to get nutrition, and that's usually through a feeding tube. 
um, that's placed in the stomach for people who are not able to recover sufficiently so that they can take food orally. Um, developing routines for bowel bladder function, these are not voluntarily able to be controlled because there's no voluntary control over basically all the muscles below the mid face. So all of these different aspects of life need to be managed. Person needs total assistance with taking care of all of their routines and you saw that very clearly I think in the film. But essentially once the medical conditions are stabilized, rehabilitation really becomes about helping the person develop a mechanism to communicate. Um, and that ends up what's being the most, what is the most important um, to folks with locked-in syndrome and the most impactful in terms of achieving a quality of life. Um, so you saw in the film, the technology was essentially using eye blinks um, and eye movements to identify single letters and to put single letters together to form words. So initially the basics are to establish consistent yes-no responses. You know, blink once for yes, twice for no kind of thing. That's the first step. Um, or using eye movements, looking up for yes, looking down for no. Next step beyond that is often the use of an alphabet chart or a letter board, and that's what they were using um, in his case. Um, it may be a simple board with letters um, progressing, you know, just like the alphabet, or what they used in the film in his case was they ordered it based on frequency of use of letters. Uh, what happened to his right eye that he had, that had to sew it up? His right eye muscles were affected so that he couldn't um, blink consistently. And if you can't blink and your eye stays open for too long, then you get damage because it dries up. The cornea can be damaged. And one of the treatments for that is to sew it closed. I don't know how long people with this syndrome can live. I know there's varying degrees depending, but what would you say the longest amount of time someone with this syndrome can live? There are those like Bobby, like the people who you just saw in the clips, who are able to find meaning and purpose and quality of life living with these, what I think all of us would consider devastating physical injuries and conditions. There are others who decide that they don't want to, and there have certainly been cases of people who petition to get themselves taken off of mechanical ventilation, which is probably the most common life-sustaining um, technology that people will require. Um, and, and there have been uh, struggles in different states. Different states have different laws about this. Um, and there have been struggles where people have wanted themselves removed from life support. The state has fought it or family members have fought it. Um, and that ends up being a legal battle. But, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any answer to that. I think people have to search within themselves. Um, depression being the obvious um, sort of secondary effect of this kind of devastating injury. Very, very high rates of depression and people who are depressed have a very hard time generating motivation or will. Um, and then that spills over into their ability to, to participate and be active in these kinds of uh, rehabilitation efforts. So it's a, it's a huge barrier. Um, and it's also a huge potential. You know, it's, it's very much a, a two-sided coin and it depends on how you look at it. I mean, some people would view that film and, and see it as a story of tragedy. I see it as a story of triumph. Um, and it, it, it's really, in my opinion, as a rehabilitation psychologist, my work is very much about helping people get from viewing themselves as victims um, and without hope to viewing themselves as someone who has a purpose and a sense of meaning and potential to grow and thrive and so forth. That's the key. Thank you again so very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the questions. That was fabulous. Really appreciate that.